wonderful to be here. Um, I'm going to talk um, in, in kind of a bigger picture. I'm going to weave into this a lot of the work that um, my group has been doing around precision oncology. It's also going to try and entice many of you to help us because we need as much help as we can get. Um, but I want to start with one comment. This is really important. This is a from a colleague, Bruce Press, and I thought the slide was so important that I wanted to repeat it. Um, we often tend to focus on uh, technology as a limitation for us when we're thinking about cancer care and um, improving uh, patient outcomes. And unfortunately, it's not that. There's also this other axis, which is social. And so we tend to think about a lot of the compute issues in terms of is it scalable, is it secure, harmonization, even the data sharing. But as we move into this aspect around sharing, collaboration, data analysis and fluency, interpretability, those are all social constructs. And if we fail to recognize this, then we're really not going to get any farther. And much of my message is going to be around, as computationalists or as biologists or wherever you're coming from, or as technologists, really focusing on that endpoint that ultimately, hopefully, we all have the same goal of trying to improve patient outcomes, patient care. That could be mechanistically, that could be more clinically or translationally applied. But we have to think about this marriage. We can't focus just on one axis. And, and that's what I'm going to try and highlight for you. So I'm going to um, start with, uh, in that exact vein, kind of thinking about some of those points that were on that slide. And the first one I want to do is think about how we think about collaboration. So um, one of the things that you're going to hear me say repeatedly today is this idea of an ecosystem. Uh, and I'm going to use it in a lot of different contexts. And so the first one is as, as a collaborative ecosystem. So there's some really important characteristics of an ecosystem. It is sustainable. It has very complex inputs. Um, it actually can be, it's a very rich resource, right? And we know this. And these are the types of things that we want to think about. We don't want to think about it being siloed. We actually want to think about, and especially with collaboration, how do we sustain these collaborations? Um, this was uh, from Stanford, and I thought this was really important because what they start to think about are a number of the pieces that are actually uh, critical for us, uh, and, and some of them we forget about. For example, how do we enrich our interactions? We can put three people in a room or ten people in a room or have a think tank and say, let's all collaborate, but it may not actually happen. There's an inertia to this, and do we understand that? Also recognizing that some problems we actually will not be able to tackle alone, and that's really critical. So one of them... Uh, is one that we just uh, completed the first major phase of is the BAML consortium. So this is uh, a cohort of patients who all have acute myeloid leukemia. This is a blood cancer. Uh, and this was the largest data set of its kind in terms of uh, having a cohort that was longitudinally and functionally and omically and clinically characterized. Um, it's a very important resource, and I'll talk about that continually throughout here. But this is one where it required us thinking very differently about collaboration. And so a lot of the kind of common models about um, data ownership or uh, intellectual property, we had to rethink in order to make this happen, because something of this scale would not have been possible. So what you'll notice at the top is 11 different academic uh, medical centers that were contributing 900 patient samples. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, a large amount of uh, characterization. When it came to the modeling, it wasn't just my group. We had partnerships with Microsoft, Intel, and Sage Bio Network. They were all equal partners in thinking about how to either handle or manage or analyze this data. Uh, and then for target validation, and especially thinking about the clinical trials and the drugs themselves that were part of, we were doing massive drug screening in these patient samples, that required 11 different pharmaceutical partners. So this is a very unusual model in that everyone has to agree from the get-go that we're all equal in this, and that the data, and this was a critical tenant, was going to be shared upon completion. So there wasn't this idea that the data would be private or locked up for years, um, that, and that's a critical point that I'll come back to. Uh, just in terms of some of the numbers, I already told you we had uh, 900 uh, partners, but you're looking at um, about 123 different drug combinations, 243 non-proprietary drugs. There were some proprietary drugs that were done, which is important to remember because the pharma partners, around 34,000 labs uh, for patients in general, 25,000 that were specific for our AML cohort. Um, so a really massive, massive undertaking. And what this was really part of was a larger uh, context really thinking about what are we thinking about not just in terms of um, the consortia, but ultimately in terms of cohort studies in general. So this is really an illustration kind of mirroring what was at our site at OHSU. But what you were thinking about is that patients who entered uh, into the Net Cancer Institute, 
uh, we would be uh, basically consenting them at diagnosis. And so we'd be thinking about data that would be coming from the electronic health record. We have a research data warehouse, which is a way that we can get this data in a compliant way. Uh, and then we were looking at a number of uh, kind of parallel characterizations. So this patient is actually being cared for at our cancer center. So that means that there's going to be standard labs, there's going to be some clear genomic testing that's done. In parallel to that, there is an entire research program that was being done around these functional drug screens that would be able to see, based on the patient samples, how they might respond to uh, different therapies, as well as whole exome sequencing, RNA uh, sequencing, to look at expression and gene fusions. And what I want you to remember in terms of reality is our patients would then go on to standard of care. So all this research information is sitting kind of on the sidelines, uh, and we're using it to model and make predictions. Unfortunately, for a lot of our patients with acute myeloid leukemia, those standard therapies will fail them. And so one of the reasons it was so important is we would repeat this cycle, get, do, re recharacterizing the samples after relapse, reanalyzing in terms of now are they still responsive to some of the drugs we would have predicted, because now we're in a scenario where we're thinking about clinical trials, potentially matching them to trials, and starting to really think about how we can use this information to improve outcomes. Uh, so this was an interdisciplinary effort at every single site. This is just the OHSU team, and you're looking at oncologists, basic scientists, computationalists, engineers, analysts, students, postdocs. Everyone was intrinsic and critical, and this is, is mirrored at every single of one of the 11 sites. So collaboration model that's very different internally, and that we're all working together, and also externally as a consortium. Now, it's not just enough for us to... Uh, work in this way together, we also have to think about what the impact is going to be of such a product. And I already told you that as part of this collaboration model, we all agreed that this data would be open and would be shareable. Now, I, I'm going to use the term accessible, and a lot of people think that when I say, let's make the data accessible, that just means that you can download it or that you can apply for it at DBGAP or GDC and get it. But we actually mean much more than that. Uh, and this really gets to this idea of how we think about knowledge. So this is a slide from Jim Gray, who was a scientist at Microsoft. And he did a very famous talk in which he kind of talked about these major paradigm shifts in science. And he kind of goes through history thinking about that. So the first would be the descriptive era, where you're really characterizing and cataloging the world around you. The second is theoretical. Now we're starting to think and abstract about things that we cannot see or touch. Moving into the computational, this is the era we just came out of, the paradigm that we just came out of. And now, now that we can manage data that we can't possibly store, we think about streaming data, we have very complex data structures and algorithms. And what he recognized years ago is that we would become isolated, therefore, from this. So he felt the fourth paradigm, the critical place that we needed to think about, was exploration. Can I put my hands around this data cognitively? Can I actually go from data to knowledge? Can I abstract meaning from this data? That is the challenge that faces us. So when I say accessible, that's the way that I'm thinking about it. Not just that I can download it, but can I easily get meaning or understanding from it? And that's going to be critical. Now, the title of my talk hints at not just going to knowledge, but also to actionability. That we want data that is trustworthy, because ultimately we're thinking about using this in the context, hopefully, of care for our patients in, in, in the context of cancer. So uh, one of the major uh, things that comes up when we think about modeling this, especially for the data we generate via AML, is that we have all of these different drugs, and we have some idea of what their potential targets are from pharma in terms of the original uh, applications for the drug or from various drug screens that are out there. But there's a number of issues with this data. Uh, often a lot of it is actually proprietary. There's a number of intellectual uh, 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 considerations that make the data restricted, especially when the drug is being developed. And even afterwards, it may not be shared. And of the public data, it actually uh, is very inconsistent. We have issues around validation uh, often quantitative data that would be really critical for us to understand if we're even talking about something that might be in a therapeutic range is missing. And so this really became an Achilles heel if we thought about how do we leverage the type of data we generate in beta ML, or we're actually thinking about predicting drug response or repurposing drugs. This is actually key that we understand this relationship when we're thinking about how do we match functional characterization and drug response with omics. So that relationship is going to be key. Um, and this is meaning not just in one avenue, but in many. So many of you in the room, if you're computational, you might be thinking in this area, I want to be able to predict drug response, or I want to be able to think about uh, adverse events. 
that type of computational modeling. But this has critical connotation when we think about how do I repurpose different drugs that are already approved, which would rapidly improve the timeline? Uh, how do I identify different combinations that might work well together? And thinking about actually designing some of these clinical trials, where it's actually critical that we understand and think about the control arms, uh, what the potential off-targets of um, these various drugs are. So this led, uh, this is work that was led by Aurora Blucher, who at the time was a PhD student in my lab, and Dr. Blucher is now graduating and is starting a postdoc with Gordon Mills at the night, um, to develop a framework which we call the cancer target on. And the whole idea was to be able to aggregate drug target interactions from a number of public repositories and build an evidence framework that would allow us to have some idea of confidence and certainty in the data. You see, you see these different levels. What's very important to understand is that at level three, we actually get into not just evidence and provenance, but very importantly, quantitative values around the actual uh, various assays that were utilized. And that is critical for prioritization and modeling. One of the very first things that she did was ask if we take, and this is using the Reactome knowledge base, uh, if we look at the pathways and map these targets for these various tiers to that, how many of the pathways are actually targetable or druggable? And that would be what we call light. So if you see light on that, it means that there is some drug that was in our compendium that actually could target these pathways. You'll also notice that there's a restriction here for the level three where we actually then said, what if we try to put it into what we think is actually a re realistic therapeutic range? Right, which is even being more... Uh, stringent. And the reason this is so important is because this begins to give us an idea of what are we really dealing with. We talk a lot about, and I'll show you some examples of pathway modeling or thinking about predicting patient response, but one of the questions is how much can we really target? We know now through pan cancer about a number of key pathways um, and driver mutations and other things, and one of the questions we should be asking is can we even target those critical pathways and where are we really missing uh, key information? So this is just some highlights from uh, her work, uh, and one of the things that was very important was to understand what we're really dealing with in terms of levels of evidence when we think about the amount of drugs that are available, targets, or interactions. And as you can see, it starts to, depending on how conservative, this, what I want you to pay attention to is the far right, because that's when we're really thinking about having both the quantitative value and it being in a realistic therapeutic range. We're actually dealing with a much smaller subset of data than you might think when you look at all the public data that's out there. Still important. Uh, and then we also wanted to look at some key examples where we have kind of um, information about what we hope to have, kind of the holy grail of uh, what a good example might look like for drug target uh, interaction or binding in terms of evidence and concordance versus our reality. And so the first example that we looked at is imatinib. Uh, and with imatinib, we know. And so you're looking at four different assays. And this is important because it's not just what is the concordance across studies for the same assay type. But if I look at across essays, am I seeing the same hits coming up as the major targets? So the target here is ABLE, and you'll see that in each case, it's at the top, it's ranked across the assay, so really strong consistency. You're going to notice there are some other targets besides ABLE, and this is the kind of information we want to know in our modeling. But still, a wonderful case in which we see very clearly across the assays and within the assays, very clear evidence about the target. Now we can look at another drug, and unfortunately now it gets a little bit more messy. So if we're in that same therapeutic range, we have up to 26 different targets. We have drugs that are much messier than this. So if we're now thinking about trying to model this, we're trying to say what is the impact of this drug on this pathway computationally or biologically, you now know that within a realistic therapeutic range, you have to think about 26 other targets in terms of off-target effects that actually could impact your model in terms of output, especially if you're trying to validate this. And this has implications, obviously, for combination therapies and repurposing. So where we're using all this is in um, exactly what I alluded to before, pathway modeling. So this is a partnership, and I'll show you an example of this in a minute, with the Reactome uh, knowledge base. Uh, they've been very helpful in terms of both curation of the pathways, and uh, Guan Ming Wu, who's one of the PIs, is at OHSU and has been working with us on this. Uh, this is also work, again, with uh, Aurora Blucher, who I mentioned before. Um, so you, leveraging the resource that I talked about from the AML data and the reactome pathways, we're really thinking about how we can convert these to what we call factor graphs so that we can actually compute on them and then actually model probabilistically what is the impact of mutations, what are the impact of the various drugs, and then link this together in an integrative manner to actually be able to now have very robust predictions on if I add this drug, what would the perturbation be? 
a baseline, meaning that the pathway has no mutations in it. If this pathway is mutated, what is the impact on the pathway? And very importantly, now in a very specific type of, if I'm looking at this patient who has these mutations in this pathway, what would I believe that the impact would be in terms of the efficacy of the drug or its impact downstream? Now, all of this led with beta ML to a much larger question. Um, so we know that using a single uh, or monotherapy single agent targeted therapy will not work in AML. We do not get a durable response. You will see a response from the patient potentially for a limited amount of time, but not one that is durable. Eventually, they will relapse, become resistant. And so most of our work now has actually shifted to focusing on trying to understand drug resistance and sensitivity. And you can think about this from a modeling perspective in two ways. Can I predict which combinations would prevent resistance in this first place. So rather than starting with a single drug, it's basically going to drive you to resistance because I'm going to remove right, uh, the very part of the tumor that's targetable. What combinations can I do basically to keep the tumor at bay and be able to prevent resistance in the first place? Or if the patient has become resistant, can I resensitize the patient? And that's understanding some of the vulnerabilities. So that's where a lot of our effort is now. And I hope you understand why Having this data out there and having these types of evidence frameworks are so critical so that this modeling actually can be informative and actionable. Uh, I mentioned to you about our partnership. So the target on that I showed you is completely integrated into Reactome now. It's also open source if you want to utilize it. And it's these types of partnerships that are critical. Having, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to leverage their pathways. We want to work with their curators to improve them for the modeling and pathways that are critical for us. And we want to share back the data that we've generated to them to enrich the resource. That's, that's actually, again, going to this idea of improving accessibility in terms of knowledge. Now, I emphasize to you that everything is not just in the research context. We're thinking about this clinically, and a lot of our work faults are what I call research grade. And so there's been a tremendous amount of thinking around what will it take to be able to get these into the clinic. Uh, and this is a very... Famous piece that was just by um, Keith Baggerly and Kevin Coombs, and you may or may not know them from a um, kind of a forensic bioinformatics that they did around the Anil Potty case at Duke. So they were actually instrumental in that when we think about reproducibility and forensic bioinformatics. Uh, and they came up with, at the time, and this was a number of years ago, this was in 2010, some of just the required elements that would be used if you were going to actually just leverage as evidence an omic study, thinking about it in a clinical context, right, in terms of guiding clinical trials, et cetera. We want to go much more beyond that. Uh, and so uh, Phil Bourne uh, and Yolanda Gill did work on what does it take to actually make workflows that are truly reproducible. And so the original idea was reproducible maps. So Phil Bourne is the, one of the founding editors of Foss Computational Biology. His lab is seen by many as kind of the paradigm for open science, best practices. So they took one of his computational workflows that was published and incredibly well documented and asked, how long would it take? How many steps were there that we could just take this code from the publication and run it through and get the exact same result? And this is in what we consider to be one of the best labs in the country. It took 280 hours. And so what you'll notice here is the steps that were minimal, where almost anyone could do it, a novice, or were author only. So even there, we're still not capturing some of the steps or decisions that are being made. And if we're really thinking about moving from research into the clinic, we have to capture this. So other work um, that we need to consider as well is that the algorithms will matter, right? So if we're thinking about this in the context of clinical omics and mutations, the callers themselves will give us different results. And this will come up, and I'll show you in a minute, also in the clinical context for the, the actual labs themselves in terms of how they curate these variants as well. So these are the types of things that we have to be thinking about if we're going to try and make this reproducible and transparent. <laughs> so what we want to have then, if we're thinking about this in terms of the clinic and CREA, is that we have a high degree of documentation, we have robust versioning, and we have to be thinking about novel ways for pipeline validation and documentation. And so Yolanda Gill, who I mentioned just two slides ago in the reproducibility maps, that 280 hours that she was documenting with Phil Bourne, she came up with a system called WINGS, which works around the idea of semantic workflows. So we're not just thinking about reproducibility, we're also thinking about minimizing errors. So there is actually what we consider to be a semantic or intelligent reasoner that will actually look at the data. There's a logic and constraint. So for example, a common error that you could make if you were variant calling would be that you take a different annotation version than the actual genome build that you had used. Right? That's a very easy error that someone can make if they didn't know what they're doing or, or you just weren't paying attention. This has those type of constraints, we'll actually catch that. 
and look at it because it actually is it's looking at the different types of objects and the associated constraints with it to minimize error. So not just enough to say I have a reproducible workflow, but can I also, when I know that I'm going to have these endpoints with human interaction, <coughs> can I minimize the errors around them? And this is just an example for varying the annotation of what one of these workflows looks like. Um, all of this goes towards the idea, and this is why the evidence and the actionability is so important, of how do we actually augment decision support, right? And so a lot of this is going to be, and this goes back to that point of data exploration, it's not enough that a computationalist or a biologist understands the data. It has to be that the oncologist or the molecular pathologist understands it and can make a decision. We don't want to remove them from this equation. So we have to have transparency that they can use their expertise. And even if there's a very complex computational algorithm underlying this or you know, a variety of different omics technologies, it has to be that they can understand what the uncertainty is and can make a decision. And so that, that's really the challenge that we face with this. Now, I mentioned to you before that the variant annotation is a big piece and that it affects the CLIA labs as well. So um, one of the major consortia that developed at the behest of NIH in the United States is a consortium called ClinGen. And they are uh, uh, basically comprised of patients, clinical labs, researchers, and clinicians, all focused on trying to answer three key questions. Is something clinically valid? And so here we're saying, is this gene really associated with this disease? Is this variant causative? We're thinking about pathogenicity, very important in cancer. Is this information actionable? We're thinking about utility. So the idea was to build a resource or a knowledge base that would be trusted, and this is what is ClinVar, that actually would provide these levels of evidence and aggregate data. It could be patient reported that comes from the clinical labs and can have these expert reviews. So this is the ultimate model for it, where you would actually see it, and this is the long-term vision, but the idea is that you have the actual data, you have patient registries, this is uh, ClinVar itself, the data we talked about, you have the CLIA labs, and ultimately integration with the electronic health system so that this data would actually be, when we think about decision support, augmenting uh, clinical decisions and helping in clinical guidelines, right? And this gets to the very heart of actionability for mutations and variations. Is this something that I can actually act on? Is there actually, it's going to actually inform a treatment decision that I have. Now, the hard part computationally is that we end up doing this gene by gene. So I've been on a panel for inherited myeloid malignancies. Uh, we've been working for a year on one gene, if that gives you any idea of the amount of time that's involved. I'm on a computational component. These are the types of workflows that are involved where we look at evidence like family segregation, functional assays, computational evidence, and, a, and here's a very important part, computational evidence is only supportive. It's not going to actually be led to make a final pathogenicity call. And also very importantly, as we already talked about, the algorithms, just like they did for variant calling, will disagree. So we have to make decisions around, do we take an ensemble approach, do we use meta callers, how many different callers do we need to feel confident, even in just a supporting call. So this is a very laborious, but actually a very critical process if you think about the fact that we eventually want to impact clinical guidelines and be able to get this data into uh, something that actually would have impact for our patients. Now, when I told you about the BAML resource and kind of keeping in line, this is kind of a final point around data accessibility, um, it was very important that we would maximize the impact of the community. So this data, and I've talked to people today who were using the data, was available under embargo to partners. Uh, uh, immediately, and we've been made sure that the data is shared in a format that could be used by computationalists immediately. It's also, uh, you know, in partnership with DDGAP and GDC available that way. But what about the people who aren't going to have that level of computational support or have immediate questions that they want to ask? And so what we wanted to do was provide a visualization platform, and this is Visome, that allows us to um, allow them to interact. So the same day that the Nature paper went out, this platform went live, and so anywhere, anyone in the world, anyone anywhere in the world would be able to start to interact and ask questions of the data, and look at various things in terms of drug sensitivity or mutation. Uh, one of the components that we did is at the individual patient level for each patient, we actually prioritize the variants. Uh, thinking about this both mechanistically, but as well in terms of prioritization, so that you can actually look across the patients or within a patient and ask. Uh, which variants are actually critical, put this back in the context of the drug response itself, 
be able to think about this from a network framework, integrating all of that data together. So that was really important to us that it be, again, in terms of accessible, real-time, hands-on, interactive aspects with the data. So another piece as well was uh, thinking about for the complexity of the data, what are the types of new ways of visualizing the data that would be critical? So this is what we call the buzzsaw plot. We did actually um, pretty complex integrative modeling of this data in the fact that we were now thinking about um, what would normally be one endpoint for the analysis was actually a feature in the modeling. So if you see colors here, this is actually indicating that these were co-expression uh, clusters or networks, subnetworks, that we found as signatures for our patients. And what we wanted to understand is how often did those co-occur either with each other or very importantly with some of the critical mutations. And we did this per drug. So you're just looking at one example of one drug here. On the, so the cords are telling you basically by the thickness how often these co-occurrences uh, appear. And then you're looking at, uh, with the red and blue, the drug sensitivity or resistance as well. So how often were they co-occurring? What were we seeing in terms of the modeling with our predictive response relative to drug sensitivity or resistance? Being able to take multiple different features or even aggregate features and think about how to model and visualize them so that they could be rapidly digested and interpreted. So the final piece that I want to focus on is, again, returning to this idea of an ecosystem. And there's been a, a ton of work nationally in the United States on a cancer data ecosystem. And this came from the Cancer Moonshot. Um, and the whole idea was, could we create something, and again, going back to that theme, that is sustainable, that is scalable, and really expanding it beyond the traditional model. So this goes back to the idea of thinking, kind of breaking that idea of the traditional uh, just research only aspect. So how do we engage basic scientists, clinicians, patients, all in this? Again, focusing on accessibility and really accelerating the pace of discovery. So this is a diagram illustrating the four pillars of this ecosystem that we came up with on the Blue Ribbon Panel uh, Working Group. So here is the clinical component, so really thinking about clinical decision making, which I emphasize with you today. Here's the traditional research part that we've talked about before. Here's things that are actually focused on the patient. That's either in terms of their agency or contribution of their own data or being able to get data back, to be able to interact with their data, um, and have them truly engaged in this process and feel empowered about it. And then finally, the key component of interoperability. How do we ensure that we have data standards and harmonization that allows us to be sustainable, allow more uh, different groups to be able to contribute data and to keep this going? Uh, at my institution, this is... Uh, being mimicked in terms of what we're thinking about for our own precision oncology program in terms of a data ecosystem. And I just highlighted again, thinking in terms of this bigger roadmap of the different areas that we're thinking about, not just clinical trials, but novel treatments, um, as well as understanding adverse events and combination therapy. Uh, and ultimately, what we hope with all of this, and that's why the data sharing piece was so important, is that we're improving patient outcomes. Um, I want to emphasize a, a, a component that came up, a story that came up a couple of years ago that I think is really important. There was a, a journalist named Lori Buckland who uh, was in Los Angeles, and she was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, and it had metastasized to almost all the major sites. Normally, you would think that uh, her timeline in terms of survival would be very short. She was what we call, um, uh, you know, one of these amazing cases, and a one where she lived far longer than anyone expected. And at the end, when she was dying, she wrote an op-ed piece um, in the paper that actually commented on the fact that it was going to be criminal that her data would die with her. Because what if there was another patient like her that was, again, having similar types of metastases? Potentially, what could they learn from what happened with her to help the other patients? And we see this over and over again. So that's why we actually believe that that link around data sharing and the data accessibility, the knowledge piece, don't just dump the data out there, but think about how to actually make sure that it's mineable and, and actionable, is so critical for our patients, for thinking about guidelines for our oncology, um, in terms of new clinical guidelines, and then obviously in terms of hopefully new therapies. Uh, and as I hope I've emphasized, I talked a lot about accessibility in terms of knowledge, and I know that and that comes in the context of primarily we're thinking about that with uh, a researcher looking at this data, can they mine it in terms of new discoveries, or an oncologist in terms of making decisions, but we also need to think about our patients. This has huge implications in terms of their agency over their data, their ability to understand it's transparent, 
uh, around it and their ability to negotiate how that data is used. And, and nationally, in the United States, and I would argue internationally, this is the discussion we're having now. Because for a long time, we've kind of left them on the periphery, and now they need to be front and center. So uh, what I hope I've done, and I'm jet lagged, this is actually me talking slower, believe it or not, uh, <laughs> is highlighted, I think, a, a couple of key takeaways that um, I think are really important. We really have to start thinking differently um, about how we're engaging in collaboration and research and our relationship to our patients and thinking about the data in general. There's been a lot of fear around holding on to data or uh, just you know, not really thinking and taking the time to make sure that it is accessible and interpretable. And we're missing huge opportunities in terms of data mining. We're using data that's already out there, collaborating with others. I think that is really incredible, especially when we think about secondary analysis. There's a tremendous amount of data that's out there now. And the question is, are we not maximizing it because we really can't get our hands around it? And I don't mean can we download it, but again, these same issues. Um, and then very importantly, uh, wanting to think about how we can leverage this data ultimately, and I focused a lot today because it's where my area is on actionability, thinking about patient certification, but this also feeds back into basic research when we think about mechanistic studies as well. So um, that's what I wanted to, to cover today. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.